fear is not a bad emotion. Look, fear is there to protect us. Fear is there to say, I'm going to protect you from this thing over here that's a threat, this thing over here that's a threat. It's just a matter of having a conversation with fear and saying, look, I know you're trying to protect me, but really we have no control here. It's when we push our emotions down and when we suppress our emotions that we get into trouble. This is Dr. Joanne Cacciatore. She's a tenured research professor at Arizona State University who has dedicated her life to helping people work through trauma and grief. Try, 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 try all you want. You cannot chase happiness. It doesn't work that way. That's an inside job and it can only ensue when you act in the service of others. God will come and put you on his anvil and fire up his forge and beat you and beat you until he turns brass into pure gold. So Dr. Joe, you are a professor and a researcher at Arizona State University. First of all, welcome to the show. But second, you've dedicated your life to something that people just don't want anything to do with. That, that is true. I'm, I'm, I'm not a frequent invitee to parties. <laughs> and yet, this is what I find most interesting. When you teach your course at university and you get the cards back from students who explain why they signed up for the course and what they got out of it, this course on trauma, this course on death, this course on working through grief somehow changes people. It's the thing they don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about. We want nothing to do with. And yet when we come to learn about it and come to accept it, it changes our thinking. Why should we be more willing? Why should I be more willing to think about and talk about death and trauma? Oh, there's a long list of reasons why. Um, but I do think that confronting such a, an existential threat to not just ourselves, but perhaps more importantly, those we deeply love, um, changes something within us in terms of our awareness of finitude and opens us to a more full, more real, more authentic, more vulnerable, more connected life. I, I don't know any other way to put it. It's inescapable. You know, the writer Anne Lamott says 100 years from now, all new people. So it's it's completely inescapable, right? We're all facing the same sort of final end. And pretending that we aren't and pretending that we aren't all going to succumb to to the inevitable loss of someone, death of someone we love very, very deeply Pretending that we won't confront that doesn't really help us live a full life. It, it, it creates a fragmented version of a life. And so I would, in a, in, in a cliff note sentence, I would say the, the reason that we confront this is and talk about this is so that we can really, truly live our lives. You know, I think on everybody's journey, um, you know, for entrepreneurship or if you're an ambitious creative, at a certain point, you're going to come across, you know, on Instagram, you're going to come across the line, you don't want to die with regrets. And I always struggled with that because, I mean, I don't want to die with regrets for sure, but it's just such an abstract thing to say. Like, it hasn't been made real to me. Yeah. And yet... Um, just recently, I was at Ed Milet's book launch uh, in Raleigh, and I'm I'm backstage, you know, and Ed Milet's there, and Dean Graziosi's there, and Marie Forleo's there, and all these all these amazing people are there. But coming off the heels of the shooting in Texas, the school shooting in Texas, Ed's keynote, he touched on like, you don't know when your last day is, you don't know when your last moment with a loved one is. You just don't know. And so as I was preparing to talk to you and, and think about, you know, off the heels of, of what's happened and Ed's keynote and in speaking to you, I almost wonder for those of us who are ambitious, who don't want to die with regrets, it just can sometimes seem so far away. It can seem so abstract. It can like, it, it's hard to make myself push myself today when the future is so unknown and so in the, in the, in the distance. Mm-hmm. You work with people all day, every day who have faced this. How can, how can we make this idea of not dying with regrets just so much more real? Well, I mean, I think there's a difference between facing our own death and facing the death of someone we love very much, right? So facing our own death. Uh, so I work primarily with people who have had traumatic grief, uh, traumatic loss. And so that means 
the deaths of children at any age and from any cause. It means um, suicides and homicides. So this is my primary focus of work. And it's an important fo focus of work because facing your own death for parents is much easier than facing the death of your own child. Right. And so for people who are thinking about their own death, I can see where it's a little more abstract and because there is something, a sort of a protection system in us that doesn't want to confront the reality of our own finitude. Um, I will tell you without a doubt, I think about my own death every day, multiple times a day, yeah. just by the name. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When I go to bed at night, I, I think, what if I don't wake up tomorrow? You know, and when you live that way, it's hard to live that way because you have to consciously put it forward because it's in the background. It's always there. It's this hum of mortality that's always there in the background. But if you live consciously, then then, you know, then you, you can you got to push past the fear because there's an initial resistance to it. But once you push push past the fear of our own sort of mortality, then and, and you can get into sort of this um, flow of understanding that I'm here for a brief blink in time and whatever good I can do, uh, I'm going to do fearlessly and with ferocity. Right. I mean, it's what do I have to be afraid of? I'm, I'm only here for this much time. So the primary sort of bulk of my work isn't about that. The bulk of my work is how do you live in a world where a child can be shot in her school? How do you live in a world where, you know, where your children can be murdered? How do you live in a world where, you know, your beloved partner dies by suicide? How do you live in a world where a three-year-old gets cancer? I mean, those questions are even bigger than self-mortality. Yeah. And the question of why should I live? Why should I, why, how do I continue on? Those are questions I deal with every day with the families I work and in my research, right? Cause that's, that's my, also my area of research as a, as a scholar, right? So these are the kinds of things that I excavate and, and work with every single day. Yeah. And I, I, I respect that and understand that I'm asking a question that's slightly outside of scope, but, but the reason why I think it's, it's a, it's an interesting place to start um, for all of, for myself and even all of our listeners is that, I, I think you've spent enough time around those who have faced death. Yeah. And a bunch of us just haven't our generation, our society, um, you know, it's, it's just so different than it was 60 or 80 years ago. Or maybe yeah. if you're in a different culture or society where, you know, where there was a whole generation of young men who suddenly just disappeared because of, of war or whatever it might be. And, and this is a hard thing to get into. So you just posed a whole bunch of huge questions that I'm curious, you know, how, how do we live in a world and come to accept where a three-year-old gets cancer? How do we live in a world where a young girl of eight or 10 goes off to school and doesn't come home because she's been murdered? Like, <laughs> this is, yeah. this is a, as I'm a father of four. This is incredibly uncomfortable for me to talk about, but how, sure do we even, how do we even come to, to address these things? And, and how does understanding this again help live that richer life? This is very hard because people who haven't lost a child don't want to think about losing a child. And I understand that. And also, if if those people are brave enough to think about it, it cannot help but make that person a better parent, a more present parent, a more loving parent, a more tolerant parent, a more patient parent. I mean, if we thought for one moment my child may may get cancer and die or my child may not come home today or whatever we imagine there are so many ways that children die however we imagine our child to die if we stay with that not in a way that's paralyzing but in a way that's very real and very grounded of course statistically it's not likely and yet it happens and i'm not immune there's nothing there's no great book up there saying this is going to happen to everyone but you right and so if we if we can stay with that it will not only make us a better parent a more present and loving and patient parent but also it makes it creates a sense of compassion in us that can move us to be much gentler and much kinder to people who have suffered traumatic loss and this is the big problem for people who have traumatic loss 
is that we live in a disconnected society that doesn't really want to hear about it because it's very uncomfortable and very painful. And so they're marginalized. They go into the grocery stores and they see a neighbor and this happens all the time. This is not, this is not anomalous where they go into the grocery store and it's been three months since their child died by suicide. And they come around the corner and see a neighbor and the neighbor sees them and turns the cart around and goes the other way. It has happened time and time and time again. I hear this story. It's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a natural researcher. So when I hear the stories um, from clients here at the Sella Care Farm, I know I see the patterns and you can look at it in the research. I mean, I conducted one study and I asked about good grief support and who were the sources of the best grief support for grieving people. And we asked about mental health providers and family and friends and colleagues and spiritual communities. We asked about um, first responders. We asked you know, about acute period, doctors, nurses. We asked about all these human groups and we asked about animals and pets. And animals and pets blew every human group out of the water because humans are encumbered by their neocortex. And the neocortex tells us a story if X, then Y. So if Mary's daughter can die of cancer, then my son can die of cancer. And it's terrifying. And it creates a distance, a chasm between grieving people and and the world. And that is not helpful. The, the number one defining experience of traumatic grief in my practice is loneliness. People are lonely. They feel really alone in their grief and that doesn't help anyone. So thinking if we stay present, if we as non-bereaved people, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a bereaved mom, but if I was a non-bereaved person and I stayed with the presence of the possibility that I could lose a child, that will make me more compassionate, more empathic, of, of, of people who have lost their child, because I think about it and I go, oh my gosh, I don't want that to ever be me. I can I, I can only imagine what that would be like from the inside. And, and so I'm going to show up for this person and I'm going to do for them what I know I would want someone to do for me, which is sit down and look at pictures with me. Remember, remember my child, remember me at mother's day or father's day, send is me that, a call. Is that what people want though? Like I absolutely. Yeah. They, because, because you you don't want to be I, I this for me it's like I don't I don't want to be the person who continually brings up something that's so potentially painful for them. Oh yeah, it's already up. That's the problem, Mark. It's already there. It's there yeah. all the time. It's there all the time, and pretending it's not is actually more painful for most people. Yeah, most people their most people's experiences are that people don't talk about it, and and it becomes sort of like the elephant in the room, right? And so there's this tension you can feel in the room. No one's talking about it and everyone's just, you know, sort of trying to tiptoe around it and talk about everything but that. And so it's tense and nothing really feels authentic. It's not real. Right. The happiness cult. I write about this in my book a lot about the happiness cult. The happiness cult is one of the most deleterious things that I think has happened in contemporary society. This push to always be happy. Mm. And, you know, listen, try, 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 all, try all you want. You cannot chase happiness. It doesn't work that way. It's an that's an inside job. It happens from in here. And I love Frankel's work where he says, happiness is not something that can be pursued. It has to ensue mm. and it can only ensue when you act in the service of others. Mm. And so our happiness cult has kind of created a hostile environment for people who aren't happy all the time. And so they experience this as sort of in, in a way, psychological violence in a way, hostility. Now I understand that, um, that there are some people who, who just in certain circumstances don't want to talk about it because they may not feel safe enough, but that's usually what it is. When I'm working with grieving people and I've been doing this for more than a quarter of a century and they say, yeah, I, I just didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to talk about it. When I asked, they didn't want to talk about it because they didn't feel safe and their child who died is sacred and they don't want to share it with someone who doesn't feel safe. This is not a superficial sort of conversation that you can have, you know, at a coffee house with 12 people who are, who are there to celebrate somebody's, you know, work accomplishment, right? It, it takes intimacy. 
It takes a willingness to to go into the dark corners with someone. The problem is even the people who are supposed to do that with us aren't doing that with us. So even our spiritual leaders aren't doing that with us, even our family and our closest friends. You know who's doing it with us? Our dogs and our cats and our horses. (laughs) I mean, this is bizarre to me. I mean, when 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 I saw the results of the study, I was like. Oh, I had no idea it was going to be that off the chart. Just that much disparity. I thought maybe animals would do okay because I'm an animal lover and, <laughs> and, I, and I, and I have 51 rescued animals here at the farm, but I had no idea it was going to be that disparate. I really didn't. You know, we, I have very good friends, um, who are in their fifties and had a daughter in 94 who about 18 months old passed away, um, mm-hmm. because of, uh, because of some health issues that she was born with Um, and flash forward to, I guess maybe a year or two before COVID we have them over for a new year's party. My wife loves to karaoke. So we're karaokeing and I put on uh, Garth Brooks song, the dance because I love that song. Oh boy. And my friend turns to me and says, this is the song we played at my daughter's funeral. Yeah. And I don't think I've listened to it in years. And so, listen, it's New Year's Eve. We're, right. we're having a party. You know what I mean? Right. I'm like ready to like sing this song I love. Right. And we all just kind of stop for a moment while she, you know, closes her eyes and has her moment. Um, gosh, I'm getting goosebumps, goosebumps thinking about it. Um, and I know that for my friends, this is, this is something that they, they live with each and every day. Yeah. And maybe I should ask them this question. And, and I think I will, but with all of the people that you've worked with, once they have faced this and had to, and been forced to accept it, and then on the other side of working through it, what do they know or understand that we could, we could just never know or understand until we've been through it? Oh, you, there's just no way to understand what it is to lose a child, not from the outside. I mean, you can try and you can be compassionate, certainly, but there's, I I say there's a, there's a cellular ache that, that emanates from the tips of your hair to the tips of your toes and every cell in your body yearns for your child who died. I mean, it is inexplicable. I can't even put it to words and you can't begin to fathom what it is unless you've been through it from the inside. I mean, even, you know, you hear people talking about the grief they have when their kids go off to college. (laughs) I'm yeah, that's, it's, it's just not even, not even the same world. I mean, it's just not, it's yes. Okay. You're sad. Your kid went to college. You're going to miss your kid. Of course. Probably kind of like people who have pets, but no kids. And they say, I love my pets just as much as you love your kids. And then you go, I'm sorry, but until you have kids, you do not realize how much you can love. It's a, yeah, it's a visceral primal love. And so it's a visceral primal grief and there's, you can't explain it to someone who's not been through it. I mean, I'm a researcher and I see colleagues who study the same thing in the field, just make this error over and over and over again, where they assume that, you know, that grief because your neighbor died and you were, you loved your neighbor is different, is the same as, as grief as when your child died. Not all grief is the same. I lost both of my parents at relatively early age, and that was very, very hard. And it was very, very sad, but I didn't never, never at any point after my parents died, did I feel like I wanted to, to die myself. Mm. And I felt that way when my daughter died, period, just period. And that is not an uncommon thing for me to hear um, that, that people feel like they don't want to live in the aftermath of having a child or all their children die. In some cases, it's, it's, it's a pain that you can't describe. I mean, you just can't put it to words and you can't understand it from the outside. You can only understand it from the inside, but that doesn't mean we can't exercise compassion and love and tenderness with is, people. Is there though, a majesty or, or, or a beauty that's eventually found on the other side. Or, and the reason I ask this is because I want to believe, and, and I made this statement maybe two or three years ago, I want to believe that there is no loss. There's only opportunity. And then naturally I get challenged with, well, Mark, what about the, the loss of a loved one? And I go like, 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 you know, you're going to, you're going to stand at your, your child's funeral and, and honestly say that there is no loss. There's only opportunity. And so I'm like, well, 
no, but but I have to imagine at a certain point with a certain amount of distance, with a certain amount of reframing, is there beauty? Is there joy? Is there any, are there things on the other side of this that, that we can come to learn or is it yeah, just I mean, I think, acceptance? Yeah. I think part of the problem that I'm having, cause I'm having a strong reaction to what you're saying, which yeah. is always an invitation for me. So part of the problem is the language you're using. Okay. So teach me, right? help me. Yeah. So, so look, there is beauty that comes from pain, but it's always, it, you, we have to say first it's too high a cost and we yeah. can't, and no one from the outside can say it. You can only say it from the inside. I mean, would you dare to say to someone whose child was murdered, but think of the opportunity? Oh, no, no, I would. I would right, I know, like, I, I know. Would never do that. Right, right. And But see, there people in the world, in fact, another study I did, one of the things I found, uh, I was exploring the most unhelpful responses by therapists for grieving people. And in amongst those were the therapist attempting to find meaning in the the, per- the grieving persons, the grieving parents loss. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is that we want meaning to come quickly. We want opportunity or growth or beauty to come quickly. And that's just not how it works. And it, and it always has to be recognized and framed as it's always at too high a cost. I mean, I mean, I, my daughter's been dead 27 years going on 28 years. I will tell you, I have done a lot of amazing things since she died. A lot of amazing things. Um, I've worked, I volunteered to work with a lot of grieving people over the past more than a quarter of a century. I've started, you know, nonprofits. I've passed legislation. I've been a very busy person. And that's the energy of grief. I would give it all back in a nanosecond to have my child. The the cost was too high. I love my life. I live a very big and very full life. I have a lot of energy. I feel joy a lot. I cry all the time. I have everything I need in my emotional, you know, pantheon and and within the, the realm of my emotional grasp to live the best, most vulnerable, open hearted life possible. And I would give it all back in a nanosecond. to have my child. And so I I don't love the word opportunity. I do love the word meaning because for me, I'm not even, I don't, I don't seek to live a happy life. Happy means nothing to me, but a life of meaning means something to me. A life where I can serve others and bring my child who died, bring her love forward into the world with me. That to me is a life of meaning because in a way, when I do that, she's still with me and and her essence hasn't died. Her essence is with me. That's not a denial of death. I'm very well aware she died. Um, I have her ashes tattooed in my back. So I'm very well aware that she died. That's not that's not it. I'm talking about the essence of her that I carry forward into the world. Not in the way I want to. I would rather be, you know, you know, tending to my grandchildren. Right. That's she should she would have grand. She would maybe have children by now. And I would rather be doing that than be doing this. I really would, but I don't get that choice. Right. And, and, and we live in a society that wants to bypass the intense pain yeah. and go to the, get to the quote, good part quickly. That's not how it works. And there is no good part when your child dies, there's just a life of meaning. And in meaning, there is some beauty, the aesthetics of, of grief can sometimes be beautiful um, and, and connecting. Um, But we have, my belief is that we have to fully inhabit our grief to really ever be able to get to that place. You have to go right through the center of the hottest part of grief in order to be transfigured and be able to live a life of full real meaning and transformation for self and other. But we don't, we, we, we abbreviate it every way we can. We abbreviate it with drugs and booze and sex and porn and gambling and food and shopping and everything we can to distract ourselves from it. You know, there was a, Sam Kashavada said, a uh, Thai forest monk said, uh, was talking to people who were looking for like the, the God path, the meaning path, the transformational path. And, and uh, Sam Kashavada said, go ahead, ring your bells, burn your incense, light your candles and call out to your God, but look out because God will come and put you on his anvil and fire up his forge and beat you and beat you until he turns brass into pure gold. 
We just want gold. We don't want the beating. We want to go around it. And it just doesn't work that way, Mark. It just doesn't work that way. I know people want it and I understand why they want it because we're pain averse, but that's not possible. Just not possible. I want to thank you for um, allowing me to, <laughs> to say the wrong words and ask the wrong questions <laughs> because I, I, I don't know if, if on internally you're like humoring me or, no. <laughs> or if, if we're doing this the right way, but I, I almost don't even know how to, yeah, how, how, to, how to approach it. Um, and yeah, I mean, listen, it's a tough subject. Again, I, there are, I, there are people who have MDs and PhDs who don't know how to do this. I'm, yeah. And I'm, and I'm not, that is not an exaggeration. The vast majority of people I meet as far as emotional intelligence and equanimity around this subject it's it's just not something that we've ever been taught. It's not something that we really have ever explored really truly from an insider's perspective. We explore it from the outside often, you know, sort of saying, oh, this person has a mental disorder because da, 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 without taking into account that his mother died when he was five years old. Right. <laughs> right. And this is this is this is the problem with our system, our our quote mental health system, which should really be an emotional health system. Our quote mental health system uh, is all about pathologizing normal responses to pain rather than acknowledging and and being proactive in the initial, after the initial trauma and loss and providing the kind of support people need so that later it doesn't come out behaviorally or in, in, in cognitive distortions. Does that yeah. make sense? It, it does actually. And uh, it reminds me of something I've heard you say where it seems like we've made an effort to, I don't know if the right word is, is medicalize, but it seems that we've made an effort to use uh, pharmaceuticals or use medical treatment to somehow framework in grief or natural responses to trauma or other things as you're as you're mentioning and there's of course a place for pharmaceuticals if if it's if it's necessary for treatment but i've always been very uh against that i guess um are there are there natural ways that we can work through this type of grief and this type of trauma and, and then oh, yeah. potentially even leverage that in other areas of our life when we're not talking about just because trauma can exist in all forms, uh, big and small, but are there, are there things that we can do or things that, that you found very effective that we can then do to even hit the small things in life and just get through them better? Well, I'm not a small things in life person. Oh, yeah, but, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but for the big things in life, I mean, I, what helps is connection. You know, which, which is what makes, did you read my latest blog on the naltrexone study I've and not, the prolonged no, grief? Oh, it's okay. Um, so they're testing a, an addiction drug called naltrexone. And uh, I found a copy of the grant and was deeply disturbed by the language of the grant and their stated intent with the grant. So naltrexone is an addiction drug. So they use it to treat addicts. And the, the postulation in this grant was that when your grief lasts too long, uh, a certain prescribed proscribed period of time by sort of the higher uppers in psychiatry, um, when your grief lasts too long and is too intense and you're yearning for the person who died too much, and for too long, I should say, not even too much, but for too long. Um, and you have a loss of identity. I mean, what parent whose child dies doesn't have a loss of identity, right? Um, and you question, you know, you're having these existential questions of crisis so, that all- so What you're saying is all the natural responses to- All grief. the natural responses to an unnatural but, loss, exactly. if we de deem it a little bit outside, like, yeah, this is all a little too much, then- Then you have a disorder. Then it's a wow. mental disorder called prolonged grief disorder. And, and this is the study. So the study was to treat prolonged grief grief disorder with naltrexone, an addiction drug, because they assert that that reaction is a, a reaction of addiction. So you're basically addicted to the person who died. Yeah. Is that, is no that a thing? No. no, they say it's a thing, but in my opinion, it's not a thing. And if someone ever told me that about my child who died, we would have words. Yeah. We would have words. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say we would have words, but 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 listen to the even more dangerous part of this. They're testing the naltrexone drug and stated as a mechanism, desired mechanism of action. 
in the grant stated desired mechanism of action is a severance of connection to one's closest loved ones. Yeah, that's what's going to help the person get over their pro, their new, their mental disorder, prolonged grief disorder. That's what's going to cure their their prolonged grief disorder is that they will have a severance of connection to their closest loved ones. And that mechanism of action will cause them to detach from the person who died. And also a drug doesn't target just a dead person. It's, it's just going to it potentially I, I, I mean, I don't know, but I am I can imagine that this will just create more detachment. More isolation, more loneliness. More loneliness. More disconnection. Exactly. Well, and if you imagine, for example, giving this to a person whose youngest child, age three, dies of cancer and has two older children. Yeah. So let's just say this bereaved mom actually did want to detach from her child who died, which I, I've been doing this work a long time and I've not, never met a parent who wanted to not be connected to their child who died. Never. Across and, the board. And, and it sounds like this is all in an effort to make those around you more comfortable. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's because, always, because you're taking too long to get through this thing that we, that we feel long. you should be over. Well, and this is the point of my last blog, which is an important point. They use that same rhetoric of sort of impaired social functioning back in the seventies when homosexuality was deemed a mental disorder. Like there was a time when homosexuality was deemed a mental disorder. Yeah. And of course, let's not forget women who are hysterical, right? Yeah. So, so there was a time when homosexuality was deemed a mental disorder, but only if it created an impairment in the ability to function. It's the same rhetoric they're using today for grieving people. Ironically, once society started to accept at least a little bit better, um, the GLBTQI population, which wasn't known as that back in the 70s. But once they started to accept people for who they really were, then then people started to do better in society and come out of the closet and be more open. Right. It's insidious. It's insidious what we're doing. And then think about people from BIPOC communities, black and indigenous people of color for whom social connections are the fabric that insulates them against prejudice and oppression. And we're giving a drug with the stated intention that it will sever their ties with their closest loved ones. I mean, it to me, I, I don't even know how this passed an institutional review board. I don't know, because to me, it feels like, you know, it, it, it's the ultimate of psychological colonization. It's the ultimate of people who aren't affected by it coming in and emotionally, psychologically colonizing vulnerable people. I, I just can't even I my colleagues and I and every colleague, I sent it to one of my colleagues at at, um, at NYU and I said, you have to read this grant. And he emailed me back and said, my God, it was like I was reading something from The Onion. I, I can't speak to the specifics of this, but what you're touching, what, you're re- what I'm reacting to is this ever-present fear, worry. I'm very untrusting of institutional anything. And yeah. we know that this is an issue, right? We know that, that, the, that the general public's level of trust to the press is at an all-time low. Politicians forget about it. But there's big money everywhere doing everything in an effort to what placate or or ease or just help people get through these these things that we're supposed to face in life. Like, is there like an original version of this, which is like, hey, if we go back, like the paleo diet is somehow based, I guess, on this idea that we used to live a certain way and living a certain way is healthy. Is there a certain way that we need to address grief or, or trauma? like a certain set where it's like this, this is the way the humans were built to deal with this stuff. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm all about community-based intervention, right? I'm all about, I'm all about people helping other people. Um, And, and we used to do that. I mean, there was a time when we were, when we were better, when churches were, you know, (laughs) places, actual places of comfort for people who were grieving. And then the whole, what seems to be a giant business these days. Well, yeah. And, and the whole sort of prosperity gospel thing, the whole Joel Osteen, you know, just trust God and good things will happen to you. And if something bad happens to you, it's your fault. And that whole prosperity, it's the happiness cult. It's the, the grace cult. I would call it all it in, in religion. You know, I mean, yeah. one of the things I tell people who, who, with whom I work, um, who are deeply spiritual, who are really struggling with their suffering is, is it possible that, 
that that your grief and your pain is a way into spiritual practice, not a way out. Mm. You know, that 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 spiritual practice is what helps you to be with grief. It doesn't it's not a way out of your grief. It's a way into your grief. It's a way to be with your grief. And, you know, that means that 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 has meaning to people. It makes sense to people when they really think about it. They go, oh, yeah, Jesus wept. Right. For the Christians, Jesus wept. Right. Yeah. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Great. You know, <laughs> let Jesus weep. Why can't we weep too? Kind of thing. And so people start to learn. One of the things that that that's important for, for my work with people is not helping them to accept what happened. I don't even think people have to accept what happened. I'm not a big acceptance pusher either, but I do think we need to accept how we feel about what happened. Right. Oh, break that, break that down. So yeah. I've so I've always been told that acceptance and, and I kind of believe this, like acceptance is the first step. If you, if you cannot, if you cannot accept or deal with truth or what is what you're facing, then you're kind of living um, because it's too painful. It's too hard. You're too scared, whatever it is. You're kind of living in a fantasy land. Yeah, I so. <laughs> oh, and, so, and we're saying that's okay in this in these wait, types of moments. Santa Claus, uh, you know, I mean, you know, so what? So we live in a fantasy land. Look, it's hard. Look, it's hard. There's always a part of us that knows the person is dead. Like we yeah. wake up every day and his toys are in the corner and he's not playing with them. So the first thing we have to do is operationalize the word accept. When people are like, you have to accept the death. What does that mean? I know he died. Do you mean I have to accept it in the sense that I have to be okay with it? Because if that's the case, that is never going to happen. I'm never going to be okay that my daughter's dead ever. But I do need to accept how I feel about her constant. I call it the presence of her absence. I have to learn how to integrate the presence of her absence in my life. I have to learn that when I have re-grieving moments, pull my energy in go for a hike with her, meditate, cry, write, read. I have, I'm, I have a slight book obsession. <laughs> read. Do the things that I know tend to the wound and accept all of my feelings. Like I don't push away guilt. I don't, I have guilt over my child's death. I know it's not rational guilt, but I have it. But I, it, it, if I push it away, it gets stronger. It just pushes back. So I accept it. I work with it. And then I let it move. I don't cling to it either. I don't do this. And I don't do this. I just let it be. And that's what I mean by acceptance of how I feel. I, I'll never accept that she's dead. I, I don't like it. If, if by accept, you mean okay with it, I'll never accept it. And that's usually what people mean when, when they say you have to accept that they're dead. What they mean is you have to be okay. We know they're dead. It's not like we're pretending they're not dead. They, we know they're dead. I know my daughter's dead. Every day I wake up, she's still dead, right? And people know this, in the beginning, maybe not as much because like if you're, for example, if your older child died, if you have a 30 year old child who dies, who's still your baby, by the way, they never stop being your baby. You are your parents' baby. And they, you, we are always our parents' babies, assuming we have good parents who love us. Right. And most parents do. Um, but the, for a 30 year old who dies and who lives outside the home, it may be a little harder to adjust to the reality because you didn't interact with that person every day, right? Or he wasn't there. Your child wasn't at your house every day. So it may take a while to sink in. It may take a few holidays, but really we know that they died. At some point, everyone knows they died. It's not a matter of accepting that they died. It's a matter of accepting how we feel that they died. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. You know, one thing, uh, I, I have probably been the most fortunate person ever because until my grandmother passed five years ago, um, everyone in my family either passed away before I was born or I hit, you know, 34, 35 before I lost uh, a loved one. Mm-hmm. And uh, my grandfather's still living. He's 93 and, wow. and he's, he's holding on and he's super strong. And we keep, you know, we, we, we thought he would, maybe pass right away as well. But, you know, every Christmas when we get together, every Easter, every Thanksgiving with the whole family, there's a chair that's her chair that sits there empty. And we all kind of respect that. And, and I feel like that's, that's a cool thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Um, of course, we're talking about children, not grandparents and all these things. But 
But um, still, that's somebody you love, right? I mean, that's yeah. your grandma and, and she was important. I didn't understand. I, I honestly didn't understand grief until, until I lost her. Um, and uh, it changed me a bit because until you go through it, I just, I just didn't get it. And now I, I do. And so I can understand that I, that I am more empathetic and I am, it's, it is more top of mind. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm a father of four. You know, my youngest is eight. My oldest is turning 16 this year. But I remember before they were even born, I read an article while I was traveling for work in the UK. And it was one of these newspapers. And this British family were on vacation in, in Greece. And some Yahoo decided that he was, you know, he was going to drive his boat and beach it on the, on the beach or something on a public beach. And he hit this, this two-year-old kid and, <sighs> and killed, killed the child. And as I'm reading this article, the mother is speaking about what, what she saw, like graphically what happened to the child as this boat hit them. And this is now 15 years later, uh, maybe even 20 years later, I can still remember reading the article. I can yeah. still remember what that, what that, how I'm holding on to that out of fear. I try yeah. now to not watch the news. I try not to listen to, you know, this type of stuff because I can't unpicture it. Mm -hmm. David Goggins in his book, he talks about when he was a child, how, how a, a five-year-old boy was run over by a bus in front of him and the mother's reaction that she was ripping out her own hair and he never saw anyone react that way before. I read that book three years ago. I can't not see a school bus and think about that. So I'm trying not to live in fear all the time. I'm trying to let my kids go out into the world and experience the world. Right. For those of us who haven't lost someone, how do, we, how do we not let this keep us from living big lives, though, out of fear? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the big issue, and that's what makes people push away, right? It's what keeps you know, that... that consciousness out of arm's reach. Um, it, you know, it's a practice. That's all I can say is that it's a practice that dance, that sort of delicate dance between fear and freedom, right. For our, for the people we love, you know, of course I had three other children when, when my daughter died. And so my inclination was to uh, over protect and over mother. And I probably did for a while, <laughs> to be honest. And then I, you know, would sort of work with myself and practice just, you know, you can't protect them from everything and started to realize that even things, things that I think I can control, I can't. I mean, you know, I work with a bereaved father whose 11 year old woke up in the morning and had a headache. And three hours later, he was dead of an aneurysm. You know, that we, we like to think we can control. That's the, but the reality is if we can keep in mind that there are a lot of things that we can't control that are out of the reach of control of our control. And we, and we, I always say this act in love, not fear. If we act in love, not fear. And I'm, not, I mean, it, it's so fine to be protective of your children. It's fine to tell them about the dangers of, you know, driving drunk or um, defensive driving, even when they get behind a car as you're coming, as you're, you know, you're having a 16 year old, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm sure you're thinking about that. Right. And uh, it's absolutely fine to, you know, to tell parents about um, sudden infant death syndrome and how to reduce the risk. And, you know, those are really important things. We want to reduce as much risk as we can, but there is no freedom from risk. You know, we there are risks, there are risks for everything and there are no guarantees the only thing that we can do is just live the best version of our lives that we can in any given moment and love fiercely without any withholding. And then we know that even if something happened to us as parents, we don't have regrets. You know, we're not leaving our children doubting whether or not we love them or, you know, like I, when, when my kids were younger and they lived at home and I would put them to bed, you know, I, I would make sure that I told them everything I needed to tell them Every night before they went to bed, we would do a book. And then we, I would say, you know, I love you more than the moon and the stars and you're everything to me. And I, you know, and, and I used to do, there was this little book called the kissing hand. You're, you, you're probably too young for that, but <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was about a mother who was leaving her little boy for a little while or something. And she put or he was scared she was going to leave or something. And she would put a kiss in his hand and say that no matter where I am, 
no matter what happens, I'm always right here in your kissing hand. Right. So I would read that book to the kids because I, it's not just, it's not just their deaths that I'm afraid of. I'm uh, that I was afraid of when they were little. Now they're all grown. So they're, they have their lives. But when I, I mean, I was scared that if I died, what would happen to them? Right. Like how would they navigate their own grief? Because I knew how bad we were at grief in our culture. Right. I was like, so they're going to screw my kids up if I die. Nobody's going to be able to handle this. So, you know, I, I, I think living with the reality that that something could happen to you or something could happen to your family members or your children. It's scary. But if we continue to put love in the foreground. And I'm not saying we can't dispel fear. I can't make anyone's fear better. You can't even make your own fear better. But what you can do is just acknowledge fear and say, yeah, you're valid. Fear is not a bad emotion. Look, fear is there to protect us. Fear is there to say, I'm going to protect you from this, this thing over here. That's a threat. This thing over here. That's a threat. It's, it's just a matter of having a conversation with fear and saying, look, I know you're trying to protect me, but really we have no control here. And so, you know, I'll, I acknowledge you. I know you're afraid how hard, it, how hard it must be for you to be afraid of this, you know, give it a hug and say, let's be brave together. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's when we push our emotions down and when we suppress our emotions that we get into trouble, even an emotion like shame and guilt, you know, like I have felt a lot of shame and guilt over my daughter's death. And um, I don't push shame or guilt away when I feel them. I I just, why? Um, Well, it's just, because I'm her mom and I was supposed to protect her and I was supposed to, you know, protect her life. And it, it doesn't always make sense. Sometimes it does. I work with a bereaved father who ran over his daughter twice. He thought she was a bike and, um, and, you know, he has guilt and, you know, people actually have the audacity to say, Oh, don't feel guilty. Don't blame yourself. Well, I mean, he ran over his child. How does he not feel guilty? Would you, Right. And telling him not to feel guilty just causes him to have shame about his guilt. Right. So we talk about how it is to feel guilty. Um, Mine's not as direct as that. My guilt is not as direct as that, but I still feel it. And it's normal and it's okay that I feel it. I'm I have big muscles. I can carry that guilt and I can carry the shame and I can carry whatever other emotions I need to carry. They're mine. And I'm not going to that doesn't mean the stories they tell me are true. Right. So it's a matter of distinguishing the emotion from the narrative under the emotion. I accept all my emotions. I don't necessarily accept all all the stories because the stories are, you know, like, you know, you weren't a good mom and none of that's true. And I know that's not true cognitively. And in my heart, I know it's not true, but the emotion is very real. That's, that's remarkable. You were doing, um, I mean, I'm, you're doing such amazing work that no one would normally sign up for, right? Like, like I'm thinking of, you know, the, the, the little kid, they don't grow up and say, this is what I want to dedicate my life to. <laughs> and yet, I did and not yet, do that as a child. <laughs> yeah. But it's so remarkable how you're able to help not only the people who are working through this, but I still think that all, we can all learn through through the lessons and through the experience and, it, and it'll trickle down to frankly the things that aren't that like like I'm, I'm tired of i do this too i'm tired of making you know mountains out of molehills right a lot of the stuff that i get worked up about just doesn't matter it doesn't matter and working through a conversation like this it just shows how much yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. uh, that's a and, great point it's a great point And it's an important point because that's the gift of perspective, right? And when you're not bereaved, but you think about it, it does put things in perspective and it causes the shift. And my question is always like when something big happens, I'm always like, did anybody die? Nobody died. We can handle it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an important point. It's a brave point, Mark. Well, Dr. Joe, thank you so much. Last question I have for you. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is a big question. And, and, you know, my before I lost my daughter, I would probably have said love. But I say it's compassion now because compassion as a root word actually comes from so calm means with and passion actually comes from a Latin word that means suffering. 
So compassion is literally being with the suffering of the other because um, really when we can open our hearts and be with someone else's pain, with someone else's loss, with someone else's grief, with someone else's fear, with someone else's guilt, when we can really open our hearts to be with that person in a compassionate way, it causes a shift, not just in us, but in the other. And we start to suddenly start to realize there is no other, like there is no other, like, you know, um, you know, the, 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 we have 51 rescue animals here. And, and when I act compassionately toward a new animal, who's really, really hyper vigilant and really afraid because of all the awful things that humans have done to him. And I give him space and time and help him learn to trust in the, in a world, in a violent world, again, to find peace and love and compassion that gives something back to me. It makes my life fuller. It makes my life more beautiful. And and in so doing, there is no other because what I'm doing for that that harmed animal, I'm doing for myself, too. When I when I see someone who is without a home and I do what I can in that moment to help that person, I'm doing that for me, too, because that's giving something back to me. There is no other capital O other. There is only this unified oneness. I know now I'm getting it sort of into spirituality and existentialism, but, but I think that's what it comes down to. And I think compassion is the gateway to that. I think without compassion, we can't get there. And so I think we need to have deep, deep compassion in, in a, in a world that is instead of compassionate, deeply violent, we are violent with the earth. We are violent with animals. We are in, in so many ways, we are violent with each other. We are violent with ourselves. And I think the only way through that, to work through that and to ameliorate that is through compassion. 